Hi! Uh, I had recorded a video about me reminiscing about my, um, well, 30 years ago where I was and what I was doing, and I haven't seen the video yet. I know it froze at some points, but um, I want to say I apologize. I feel embarrassed. Uh, so I will return. I cleared off my a lot of the videos from my desktop, so uh, hopefully that was the reason, that was the only reason for the freezing. Anyway, for this one, I wrote some notes and I just wanted to um, put, put together a brief timeline of the um, of Jewish writing. I'm trying to piece together like a chronology of all the way from the writing of the Torah, the five books of Moses, all the way through to um, the uh, Middle Ages and into the Enlightenment period. Uh, where there's a lot of evolution. The Talmud is developed and um, you have Kabbalah that's uh, developed or at least revealed over a successive um, few stages. Um, and I wanted to piece together what was, uh, what was a mindset here, what was a mindset here, um, how did this evolve, how did this change over time, especially with Kabbalah and the Talmud. And uh, Torah uh, put together like a context what was going on at the times and how it changed over time um, all right so um, I I suspect that the Torah um, was the, the writer or writers of the Torah the five books of Moses um, had been influenced by Plato's ideas um, or it had uh, Greek influence. Um, one of those reasons is that is possibly a subject for a future video. I was curious this past week about the idea of the spirit or the soul, more, more, more specifically the soul. Um, and I looked at Plato. I don't know if these are other cultures takes on the soul. I know Egypt um, had its own take on the soul. It had um, five different uh, souls, and uh, that's why there would be five different names. For, for example, a pharaoh would have like five different names. Um, uh, the most common is the son of Ray name, and the other is the, um, I, what some people may call the birth name. I, I haven't, uh, I'm a little rusty on that, but anyway, I don't know if this is common. I know in Kabbalah that uh, there are five parts of the soul, and but this is developed later on. This is like Isaac Luria describing it and possibly the Zohar describing it. I know these terms that are used for the parts of the soul or some of the parts of the soul appear in the original um, text of the Torah. But I wonder if that concept of the five parts as we understand them in Kabbalah as it's understood now and um, in Isaac Luria's time, um, or promulgated by Isaac Luria, if that was also present in the time of the writing of the Torah. Um, so I looked into Plato, and from what I, largely, of course, Wikipedia, I'll admit the source is Wikipedia for a quick reference, but um, it seemed that he had five different, or no, I'm sorry, three different parts of the soul. He had the logos, which would be the mind up here, and then he had emotion, I think that's thumia, and then he had eros, at the bottom, which should be desires. You know, you've heard of erotic love and erotic fantasy and so forth. It's the innate pleasures and desires. And then in the middle would be emotion. And then up here would be logos, would be reason. Now that nicely fits in with, um, with the Kabbalistic tree of life and uh, Kabbalah as described, as currently understood, and I, if I remember correctly, uh, understood during Isaac Luria's time. So, because um, you have a succession of 
like worlds or planes of existence uh, created. You have the Yetzira world, the, the Bria, and then the Yetzira, and then the Asiya. Um, and each of those, a part, certain part of the soul uh, dominates. Um, and in there, you have even the, the tree of life. You have, it's a, I'm sorry if this is getting complicated. In the tree of life, you have a triumvirate um, of three different um, vessels. And then the middle, three different vessels. And then the bottom, three different vessels. And then you have, at the very bottom, you have just a single uh, vessel, which represents the um, next segment or the outer world, whatever is be beyond that part of the tree of that tree of life. It's a succession of uh, duplicates of the tree of life. Um, and so that is paired, that bottom part, Malkut kingdom is paired with Keter, which would be crown up at the top. But in between you have um, three layers and each layer has um, three containers um, called Sephirot, which would be plural, Sephirot. And the top one is uh, focused on the mind. The middle part um, is focused on um, actions, and the lower part is focused on interactivity or relationships with other people. And the bottom three, well, actually seven, um, because there's one in the... Um, it get, takes too long to explain, but the bottom, essentially, the, the bottom six um, deal with emotion and the top three deal with the mind. And um, so I think that's similar to uh, Plato's concept of the soul having three parts. There's the logos, which would be the reason, and then the, I think it's thumios, um, which would be emotion, and then the bottom part is eros, which would be pleasurable desire, pleasure, desire. Um, so I, Kabbalah may have come from Plato, uh, possibly just Greek philosophy in general. Um, that's my guess right now. That's my like, uh, point, um, that's my worldview so far. And I'm investigating and seeing if, um, seeing how much, um, how much evidence I can find for it. So that's why, back to the chronology, that's why I put um, Aristocles, uh, all better known as Plato, also known as Plato, um, in at the top of this chronology. Um, 427 BCE, uh, I'll say BCE, it's before the Common Era. Basically, zero begins the Common Era. It's it's the same thing as BC and AD, only I'm Jewish, so I won't say Anno Domini. Um, 427 to 348 BCE. Um, he's a follower of Socrates and he's inspired by Pythagoras. And I'm also curious about the influence of Pythagoras uh, on, on Kabbalah um, or the earlier version of Kabbalah, which was the, um, the work of the chariot. Um, it's commonly referred to as the work of the chariot, and that symbolism appears in um, Babylonian, um, well, it, it appears in Ezekiel, for example, Ezekiel's wheel, so forth. Um, that period of, like, pre-Kabbalah um, was a study of these texts, like Daniel, I think, was also studied, uh, and Ezekiel's wheel to understand uh, the workings of God in the universe, to put it succinctly. Um, so Pythagoras had this cult. Um, I, if I remember correctly, he had specific dietary laws. He had a secret society. He had, um, uh, intriguingly, he had 10 um, arranged in a triangular formation, just the unit, 10 units of something, just 10 arranged in a triangular format form and um, his followers um, praise had this special uh, praise 
uh, like a uh, monologue, like a, um, a, a statement, a long statement in praise of the 10. There may have been a term for the 10, I don't remember. Um, but this concept of 10 uh, appears in the Bible, in the Torah specifically, and this idea of having a secret group or secret cult um, could have lent, uh, uh, gone down the road and paved the way for Kabbalah later on. This idea of understanding, oh, um, Pythagoras, of course, being in, um, part, uh, studied in part of the study of mathematics in modern day, um, it's probably not a surprise that he was uh, big on numbers, but he was big on, uh, he was um, a, a proponent, a believer in sacred numbers and um, uh, values of numbers. And as I recall, so was Plato. Um, so the Bible having these sacred numbers like, uh, sacred numbers like 40 and 10 and 12 and so forth, may have come from that. Uh, there are other reasons for um, linking Plato with possibly with the writing of the Torah. Um, and there's a, an author who has gone into that. Personally, I haven't found any evidence that the Torah existed before um, a time close to the time when Plato lived. Uh, okay, so going on from that. Okay, so that was two, uh, that was four, uh, 427 to 348 BCE when Aristocles or Plato lived. And then um, my, uh, my, um, I've been persuaded that um, the Torah had uh, possibly could have been written in 270 uh, BCE. Um, that is only about a century or something after Plato. So again, conceivably it could have been influenced by, the writing of that could have been influenced by Plato, uh, Plato's beliefs. Um, right, so you have that 270 BCE, that's 270 years before the start of the Common Era. Um, the start of the Common Era would be dated to uh, the birth of the fi mythical figure Jesus. But of course, um, you have to be very careful because um, it's not like it was announced to the world that Jesus had been born and we will start counting um, right when he, the year he was born in. Um, you have to understand that, uh, first of all, this is Roman period, so you're talking about a Roman calendar and uh, so forth and so on. Um, I personally don't believe that Jesus existed. I believe that... Um, there's an interesting book, um, Caesar's Messiah, and there have been uh, offshoot works of that or, or parallel works along those lines that um, that Rome actually um, created, the that Rome actually took the Jewish concept of a Mashiach or an anointed one who would lead, um, either, either lead Israel or um, be king over Israel during a period after Israel had thrown off the yoke of Roman occupation. Um, so anyway, that doves, delves in, that dovetails into what I'm about to say here. Um, so you have 270 BCE, the Torah is, uh, my guess is the Torah is written, and then um, roughly, uh, I don't know exactly when it starts, um, roughly up until the year 70, um, the Jews, there are some Jewish zealots and um, uh, groups that have great Jewish zeal, um, some may call them terrorists, um, that uh, plot to violently overthrow Roman occupation. And my guess, and then the uh, year 70, that's when the um, temple, the um, second temple, is it the second temple? The, the temple is destroyed. And um, my guess is that sometime after that period, this goes along with this, the book Caesar's Messiah, sometime after that period, um, Titus, the emperor Titus, and his father was Emperor Vespasian, um, 
um, there was a propaganda machine to uh, create a new take on the Jewish Messiah as one who's peace-loving and um, will not present such a threat to Rome. Um, so that comes in and then um, it takes a while for Christianity as we understand it to take hold. Those early Christians, I believe, were actually uh, Jews who were looking forward to a Mashiach or Messiah. Um, all right, so that's the year 70 around then. Uh, oh, and that the um, Gospels were written uh, retroactively referring to an earlier time, about 40 years earlier. All right, so um, so that's around the year 70. And then uh, the 200s of the Common Era, something called the Mishnah is written, um, from what I recall, uh, I mean, uh, as I recall, um, Judah, the prince, um, the head of the Sanhedrin, which would be um, uh, the court system, um, takes a lot of oral tradition um, and compiles a uh, list of, um, I don't want to say commandments, it's more like a compiles a list of the traditions and, and uh, customs into six groups and writes them as six groups. And I want to delve more into that because that the way he, the way in which he organized that seems to be the same style and method that um, the Torah was organized. Um, so they must have had some understanding of, of that the Torah had been organized in a way that you don't notice when you read it linearly, um, but you can read it um, pictorially. Um, all right, so this, this is a simple list. Well, not simple, but I mean the, literally a list. Um, and then about a century later, that's the 200s. In the 300s, um, it's compiled into the what's called the Jerusalem Talmud. Um, there is the... Now we see we have two different versions of the Talmud. We have the... Um, Babylonian Talmud and we have the Jerusalem Talmud. Um, I'm curious about the differences between the two because um, I see later in the 500s the Gemara was added. Okay, this is a time to explain what I'm talking about in terms of the Talmud. Um, so he had uh, a list of traditions and uh, in statement form and so there would be there was a commentary added um, by other rabbis quoting earlier rabbis and a lot of historical information put in there. Um, it's a commentary beneath each um, statement. So you'd have like a tradition from the list and then there would be a commentary and then there would be commentary. It would be divided. The commentary itself would be grouped into um, different specific takes on it like what about this and what about that and what about the other thing just based on this one um, tradition um, so that would be the commentary and as we see the Talmud if you were to look at a page of Talmud now it looks I know excuse my drawing but um, that would be basically a, what a page looks like and what I drew here, these different squares, uh, these different blocks, that would be text. That's a common format for a, a page. Um, so at the top, in the center, would be um, the Mishnah. Uh, I don't know if you can read my handwriting. And then below that, it says Gemara. So the Mishnah would be a, a single um, tradition. And then be below that would be the Gemara, which would be the commentary along, and then you can see mm, along here, um, they're kind of uh, left and right there. Um, one side is the Rashi commentary, and Rashi lived, uh, let me see, in the 1000s, which is centuries later, um, after the um, 
after the Jerusalem Talmud um, and after the Mishnah, much later after the Mishnah, the, that the Tosafot would be a different commentary. See, all these blocks around that Mishnah um, are different commentaries, uh, and those are where those are the spots where they're traditionally put on a page of Talmud. Um, so there, okay, the five hundreds, the Gemara, which would be that that first commentary, and then in the nine hundreds. Um, now I'm getting into Kabbalah a bit. Um, Saadia S A A D I A Gaon. Uh, writes a commentary based on a reorganized copy of the longer version of the Sefer Yetzira. Uh, Sefer Yetzira literally means book of formation. And um, that's the first mention I put in here of the Sefer Yetzira because, um, because people, have, scholars have tried to date the Sefer Yetzira uh, some have dated it to around the year zero, something like that, or roughly 2,000 years ago, um, based on the linguistics, or I'm not sure, entirely sure how they get that dating. Um, so I left that out. I simply put um, the first, I guess, public mention of it. Um, so that's the 900s. You At that point, you have a written commentary by... Saadia Gaon, based on a, a reorganized copy of the longer version of the Sefer Yetzirah, this Kabbalistic book. And, and then a century later, you have Rashi, who I believe is French. And Rashi uh, stands for Rabbi something, 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 but um, basically hyphenated, or um, uh, acronym would be Rashi, or the, the nickname is Rashi. Um, so that's the 1000s. And then 1174, um, in the Proven Provence School of Kabbalists, that's in France. Uh, Kabbalah was very big in France. It may have dipped into Spain. Um, that's where you get the Sephardic, the Sephardic Jews um, are in France and Spain, that region. And the Ashkenazi Jews are largely in in the other part of Western Europe, and I link them with Germany for sort of obvious reasons that they a lot there were a lot of uh, Jews in Germany uh, until until a certain time. Um, okay, so the Provence uh, School of Kabbalists. Um, this is the first mention of the uh, another book of Kabbalah called the Sefer Bahir. That's literally the book of illumination that's 1174 uh, and Kabbalists will uh, traditionally well ca traditionally Kabbalists some Kabbalists would say oh well Kabbalah goes way way back to the creation of the world or Adam or Abraham or whatever but I'm ignoring that I'm looking at the uh, first uh, awareness um, in non-religiously the first uh, objective witnessing of when these texts came, uh, were seen um, or existed uh, so 1174 Provence School of Kabbalists uh, for, it's the first mention of the Sefer Bahir and then after that 1562 you have the Mantua edition of the Sefer Yetzirah um, and then around the same time, 1534 to 1572, uh, you have the lifetime of Isaac Luria. Um, he was a pupil of Moses Cordovero. And uh, as I under, I've read, Moses Cordovero had a take on, an interesting take on reconciling things in Kabbalistic texts. And then, um, so the uh, his pupil, Isaac Luria, um, is almost like synonymous with Kabbalah. Um, he gave a whole new take on, I believe it was a whole new take on um, Kabbalah in terms of his reconciliation of things, or as he might, he might say, if I were to put words in his mouth, um, an, a description of a revelation, further revelation of what already had been. He was... Um, 
he was a proponent of uh, repairing the world and that Jews should take an active role in um, making the world a, a better place. Um, repair, that's the term, the, the, the concept of repairing the world, and that ties in with uh, the commandments and, um, and uh, refreshing your soul or keeping your soul pure and healing the soul and that sense of justice and um, um, being active in society uh, at large and making a better world um, is uh, at the very heart of Judaism today. Um, so along the side, I realized I didn't put in anything about the Zohar, which is the, the I would say the third um, great work of Kabbalah. I didn't mention that, but um, my video has already been pretty long, and I'll save that for another video. This is an ongoing thing. I just wanted to mention some key dates. Uh, all right, so I'll talk to you next time. Bye.